Hi, guys, and welcome to another episode of Seize the Moment podcast. So today we have a very special guest on. His name is Julian Bagini. And Julian Bagini is an independent scholar, philosopher, and writer. He was the founding editor of the Philosopher's Magazine and is the author of many books, including How the World Thinks, A Global History of Philosophy, and The Edge of Reason, A Rational Skeptic in an Irrational World. So today we'll be talking to Julian about this wonderful book that I just finished reading called The Great Guide, What David Hume Can Teach Us About Being Human and Living Well. Welcome, Julian. Thank you very much, Leon. <laughs> and so I want to start out with a quote, and then we'll get the conversation going. And so I, I, I'm going to just tell you right off the bat, I have a lot of quotes picked out. So I mean, I hope we could get through at least most of them. But this book is super quotable. So I love all of the aphorisms in it. And I just feel like there's so much to say and so many great ideas in here. So I mean, we'll just start and kind of we'll see where it goes. So Julian writes, philosophers have tended to exalt reason. It is rare to find one so willing to admit that the tools of their trade are so ill-equipped for the ambition of their task. But Hume, David Hume, is full of doubt, both in the power of philosophy and in himself as a reasoner. A truly ambitious philosopher must also be modest and as willing to admit doubt and question themselves as they are to doubt and question others. A true skeptic, says Hume, will be diffident of his philosophical doubts as well as of his philosophical conviction. I love that. So Julian, so tell us, who was David Hume and why is it important for us to know about him, especially in the context of philosophy, skepticism, and science? Yeah, okay, well, a lot to say there. David Hume was an 18th century philosopher uh, from Scotland in the United Kingdom. And he was, uh, you know, at the time, uh, Edinburgh and Glasgow were key centers of the European Enlightenment, uh, you know, as much as, as much as Paris was. Adam Smith was one of his contemporaries. And uh, Hume's importance is, is difficult to overstate. There was a survey done a few years ago where uh, they polled a very large number of uh, philosophy professors and graduate students. And one question they asked was, which non-living philosopher do you most identify with? And Hume came a very, very clear top, you know, above people like Aristotle, Plato, Kant, these people that are more famous in the, in the general public imagination. And this is what I think is curious about Hume. He is a real philosopher's philosopher. Philosophers love him. A lot of scientists love him, actually. Darwin read him. Um, Einstein read him and, and even suggested in a letter that Hume's ideas may have contributed to his own uh, breakthroughs. But he's really not very well known outside. And I think there are many reasons for that, to be honest. Um, and perhaps we'll come to more of them, really. But why he's important is... I think that when you look back at philosophers of the past, um, what you tend to find is, although you know people don't get every detail of everything right, some there are there are people like Plato, I mean, sorry, Hume, and I think also Aristotle, who they have the right approach. Funness that they basically got it right at the at the core. They they know what they're doing, they know how they're doing it, and they're approaching the subject in exactly the right way. And, and that approach is something which is just as relevant for us today. And so you talked about skepticism there. But the thing about skepticism in philosophy is that there is this sort of uh, difficulty, which is that I think philosophy, in a sense, always tends towards skepticism. In the same way that some people would say that science does. Science, you start by examining nature as it appears to us. And you never to be find nature is not as it seems. So there's this strange sense in which, you know, science kind of digs away and sort of undermines a lot of our common sense assumptions. And I think philosophy can also lead us towards a kind of skepticism because you start with some of the most basic questions of all, which is how can we know anything? And you can quickly come to the conclusion, well, we can't, if to know means to have certain knowledge, but beyond doubt, we just can't have it. And so a lot of the you know, philosophy is about either kind of basically negative, giving arguments for skepticism, or trying to save us from our skepticism by trying to say, no, 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 there is a bedrock upon which we can build all our knowledge. And I think Hume, and I say there's a lot of similarities between Hume and Aristotle, I think shows us the way to navigate between these things, to show us that philosophy can leave us aware of the fact that we lack a firm, absolutely firm foundation for some of our most basic beliefs, but that, that we cannot just end in a kind of a total global skepticism. But the lesson we have to learn is just a more modest one. And the lesson we have to learn 
is that we we just we you have to start where we are we have we we can't ever hope to have that totally firm foundation that doesn't leave us hopeless we just have to accept certain fundamental uh, facts about the world on a kind of trust if you like or because they're fundamental because without them nothing makes sense at all and no one can live as an absolute skeptic you know you you can claim you're an absolute skeptic at a party or something but um, that skepticism is going to evaporate as soon as you reach for the peanuts or something, right? Because <laughs> you, you believe the peanuts are real and you, and you think they're tasty, et cetera. Right. And it's so interesting because evolutionarily, evolutionarily speaking, we've evolved, right, to kind of understand the world in a really limited way. So what's so interesting is like people who consider themselves radical skeptics, they would admit this and they would say, well, readily, right, our brains aren't really meant to understand these deep fundamental truths of reality. You know, maybe, but that's maybe in the distant future, really not even plausible for us. So what's interesting is that on the one hand, you have this radical skepticism, but then on the other hand, you have this acknowledgement of like the human mind's frailty that no, we actually can't know these truths just because this is how we're built. We're more so along the lines of built of uh, kind of understanding the immediate present and particular immediate dangers. We're not really built to understand these abstract concepts, right? So I kind of, I mean, what do you think? Do you feel like there's this kind of contradiction there with radical skepticism that on the well, one hand, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, it's interesting that because I think that, you know, a lot of the time when people jump on scientific findings and findings in psychology as just being completely debunking and showing, oh, well, there you go. Well, they're kind of missing something really important, right? So how do we know that the human mind is frail? How do we know that we have all these cognitive biases? How do we know that the table is not in its fundamental uh, state as it appears to me through my eyes? We know that because of science and reason and inquiry, right? So actually, if you think about it, that's taken as a, a hell of a long way. So these tools of reason and inquiry and understanding have got to be pretty damn powerful because it's not by some kind of magic or mystical insight that we recognize that our faculties are limited. We've discovered it by pushing our understanding to its absolute limit. So, you know, I think, I think there's a sense in which a kind of radical skepticism kind of undermines itself because uh, it, it bases itself up precisely upon those things we could that we could only believe are true if we believe our powers of inquiry are actually pretty damn powerful and can reveal things as they are rather than just as they appear. Right. So interesting. And then so going into just the understanding of, um, let's say, of focusing on reason and understanding the world around us, what is it that Hume saw in terms of like philosophical systems, um, systems of inquiry, skepticism? What is it that humans, Hume saw around him that was sort of erroneous and kind of problematic? And why did he develop his own system instead? Yeah, I mean, you know, he didn't come out of nowhere. He's, he, he sort of follows on from various other people like uh, Locke and Hutchison and, 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 and so forth. I mean, no one comes out of a vacuum, that's true. But I think what he was reacting against mostly was the kind of rationalist approach of Descartes and, mm -hmm. and other similar thinkers. So Descartes, uh, you know, basically had this project of trying to show that we could have an absolute foundation of knowledge and that through pure reason we could establish uh, that you know we, reality existed we existed etc 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 and um he was didn't think that was right he reacted against that and there's a nice example of this one well, with one concrete example which is perhaps the most famous one uh, if you were to stop someone in his dream and say tell me something about rene descartes mm -hmm. uh, probably uh, actually probably some of them will probably say nothing at all but the ones who could answer would say i think therefore i am mm -hmm. and they might even say cogito ergo sum to sound impressive <laughs> so uh, descartes uh, believed he had established that my essential nature not really anyone's essential nature is essentially that of a immaterial thinking substance and it is, it's rather a remarkable argument in a way. It's, it's, I think that once you pick away at it, you can see it just does, doesn't work at all. But he, he, he starts by asking, you know, what is it that we cannot doubt? You know, because we have, in order to have a firm foundation of knowledge, you need something that is beyond all doubt to build it upon. And as he rightly concluded, when you start asking that question, what can we not doubt? You find that actually pretty much everything can be doubted. Mm -hmm. I could be dreaming right now, okay? I mean, it's a pretty lucid dream but sometimes you dreams are like that and when you're in a dream 
things seem lucid. So the fact that everything seems lucid now uh, doesn't mean it isn't a dream. And you right. can quickly drive yourself crazy when you start thinking like this. Actually, you can start to feel a bit a bit dizzy because right. you start thinking, well, no, no, no. But I mean, the thing is, in a dream, you know, you haven't been talking for 15 minutes, but in a dream, sometimes you are just right there in the middle of the action as though this has been going on for ages. I remember a very vivid dream I had many years ago. I, it was like, I don't know, I was kind of crossing some hills. It was like a scene out of like Little House on the Prairie or something. Mm -hmm. But in this dream, this was just my life. It was where I had lived. And I saw someone kind of come over the hill and said, oh, it's Parson James or something. You know? <laughs> so the feeling in the moment that we've been here forever, this isn't just a dream, isn't, isn't reliable. But the one thing you can't doubt, he said, is that you think, right? Because even when you, if to doubt that is itself to have a thought. So if I feel, oh, am I, am I thinking? Well, you're thinking when you're thinking, am I thinking? So the one thing you can't doubt is that you are thinking. Mm -hmm. Somehow Descartes manages to go from this to saying that therefore uh, what you can't doubt is that you are a non-material mind, which is indivisible, permanent, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that just doesn't work. Now, Hume takes a very, very different view to that. He says, let's be a bit more careful about this. Um, so you cannot, he doesn't, this isn't the way he puts it, but as people have put it later on, what Descartes really should have said was, the one thing you can't doubt is that there is thinking going on, mm -hmm. right? When you doubt, because when you doubt, there's some thought going on. Right. But what that thing, thinking is, you just, you, 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 that is not self-evident at all. And Hume basically says, that, you know, Descartes should have paid a little bit more attention to what was going on. Because he says, you know, for my part, he kind of says, some, like kind of, some people claim that we have this perception of ourselves as, a thinking immaterial substance. For my part, he says, assuming that this will be the same for the reader, when I enter most intimately into what I call myself, all I stumble across are particular thoughts, feelings, emotions, sensations. And I think that's true. It, if, you, if you do that, then, I mean, you can try it at home, you know, sit in a chair, try and become aware of yourself as a subject of thought. And what you'll find is you'll just sort of, you'll sit there and you know, you'll notice there's an itch in your leg. Uh, you'll notice there may be a little tune going through your head. You'll notice the thought popping up. You will notice the particular things. There isn't an awareness of oneself as a, as a being. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, again, this, this, is, this is something which uh, the Buddhist tradition in particular uh, advocates, as a, an advocate of kind of a regular practice of a form of meditation in order to become aware of the fact that there is no independently existing self. For Hume, it wasn't like a, a regular practice or discipline. It's something you do to, once you've satisfied yourself that there's no inner core of, of being, you can then go on and <laughs> live life fairly normally. Mm -hmm. so, um, uh, that's, so it's a bit of a rambling answer in a way, but it, it, it's an example, I think, of how he, he, he's reacting against that kind of philosophy which thinks that if we just think hard enough, we can establish the, the certain existence of all sorts of things, including things that we don't have any scientific evidence for, such as the immaterial permanent self. And he's saying that actually, if you think most rigorously, what you find is you, you don't reach any firm foundation. Reason can, can't do that. It's not powerful enough. Right. And what's more, observation, what we observe is always extremely limited. And ob all we observe are, are things happening. <laughs> and, and it takes a lot more than just that to kind of establish principles of cause and effect or certainly any kind of enduring self. Yeah, and what's so interesting about Hume is that I, here's the thing that kind of was tricky for me. I wonder how is it that all of these other guys ended up thinking of themselves and considering themselves as a soul or a self, whereas Hume kind of had a different interpretation from the same type of introspection that they engaged in. Like, how is it that, they, that Descartes came to the conclusion of dualism, whereas Hume was like, no, 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 these are clearly all separate entities, these bundles, right? These perceptions that I have. It's, it's, a, it's, a neat, it's a neat question. I mean, I, I don't know if everyone, I mean, it's very common to have that view of, of, of the self, this is sort of dualist view. Um, but I think, it, I, don't, I think the answer is that when people did not come to that view on the basis of careful introspection, actually. I think it was on the basis of um, some careless introspection and some other metaphysical and philosophical mistakes. I mean, the idea of dualism, which is basically the idea that there are at least two types of substance, there's material substance and there's kind of mental substance, soul, whatever you call it. I think the, the attraction of that idea isn't based on introspection. It's on, it's on the in, inability to really understand 
how it could possibly be that just a bunch of stuff mm -hmm. could be thinking. Um, you know, that's just not, you know, chemistry and physics gives us atoms in motion, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't give us, you know, feelings in, in motion or thoughts in motion, it doesn't seem. So I think there's a kind of strong intuitive sense that um, whatever we are can't be just physical because physical things are, are inert. They don't have consciousness. So this spark of consciousness must come from, from something else. Yeah. And I think that kind of strong, almost intuition, if you like, ends up informing people's philosophy. And I think one thing, I mean, Hume does say this somewhere, uh, a version of it. I never remember the exact words. But I think one of the sort of problems with philosophy is that um, a lot of the time what people end up doing unintentionally is actually theorizing to justify their hunches and intuitions and prejudices mm -hmm. rather than uh, coming to genuine conclusions on the basis of what they see before them. So I think what made Hume different was he was just more rigorous in his empiricism, his basing of his knowledge on experience. It, so it didn't come out of nowhere. I mean, Locke had a pretty similar view, actually, um, in the sense that Locke clearly believed that personal identity was n not a matter of having the same body or the same soul, if such thing as soul existed. Mm -hmm. It was about psychological continuity, largely memory. He spoke about memory mainly, but not only memory. Okay. So Locke was already kind of there with it. And the thing, as I said, it's like in other traditions, it emerged independently as an idea. And so I think, I think, I think that uh, in a way, it, I believe this is a right answer. And I think in a way, that because it's the right answer it's going to become evident to anyone who sits down and thinks about it properly mm -hmm. but when you've got a whole tradition of thought which brings with it this platonic mixture of plato and christianity doctrine of the soul mm -hmm. and this sort of like challenge to common sense that physical matter can think right. um you can see how that creates a kind of a inability for people just to sort of get beyond that they 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 you know, they, they, they almost take it as common sense that there must be an immaterial soul. Right. So how else could I exist? You know? Right. And I don't know, Julian, if you have any interest in psychedelics or marijuana use or any of those kind of uh, sort of aspects of life. But like for a lot of people who do take these trips, a lot of times they say that there's a kind of um, a, a diffusion of their thoughts or ideas and experiences where it seems like it's all sort of connected, but then it's all kind of different. And you sort of get this when you're like, let's say if you're smoking marijuana, the idea is it feels like a thought comes out of nowhere and then it disappears and then another thought comes out of nowhere and it disappears so it's very kind of buddhist-esque where the idea is it's like it's just one moment after one moment after one moment as opposed to this sort of string of a soul that kind of puts these experiences together yeah yeah i mean to be honest that's that sounds like the experience of life not on marijuana a lot of the time <laughs> <laughs> ideas come into dissolve and everything that's true i do i do find I, I do find it um i haven't i have an issue with people who claim that psychedelic experiences experiences on drugs or in mystical states are somehow reveal a more fundamental reality than ordinary life um that seems to be a really really strong assumption i mean what why should that be the case i mean i think because it feels more real to people at the time right so uh, because it feels like a heightened experience they think oh this must be showing me how things really are but it, it could be the exact opposite it could be that in these states you're getting a distortion of the way things are but because of the sort of heightened and special nature of it um it feels more real so yeah. i i think you can't really prove anything about how we fundamentally are on the basis of how convinced one feels subjectively that things are real in these states and you've got to remember that one of the one of my, you know a very common experience whilst um, high um is to believe you um re realize some phenomenal extraordinary truth right um and actually um normally uh, people either forget what that was or if they do remember <laughs> it because they wrote it down the next day they realize it was something actually ridiculous <laughs> i can't remember there's a really good story of somebody did saying you had this amazing revelation and they'd, and they'd written a note and they saw the note in the morning and it, it was just nonsense or gobbledygook or something right so i d i don't know i mean, i i think people people overstate that having said that i think um without yeah, maybe that particular thing you're talking about is something that you can uh, become as perhaps more evident in, yes. in, in these kind of states. Yeah. That's actually what um, I was thinking too, that there was a high level of awareness as opposed to yeah. being metaphysical. 
but but the, the, yeah, but the thing is that it, you, you, what what shows it's correct is not that it seemed obviously true when you're in that state. It's just that when you come back to a normal state, you can kind of check it and mm-hmm. verify it. And you go, ah, oh, that's true, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because actually, you know, that's kind of. I mean, this idea that things arise. I mean, this is a daily thing. I'm talking to you now, right? Okay, mm-hmm. and I'm just having a spontaneous conversation. And do I really have any idea where my words are coming from? I don't, do I? You know, I'm talking to you. I'm not writing a little inner script <laughs> and then delivering it to you. Sure. The thoughts are just coming out. In a way, you don't know. I know what I'm going to say no more in advance than, than you do hearing yep. it. Um, so, you know, so much of what we do, uh, you know, the inner springs of consciousness and stuff are are normally completely invisible to us and we're we are on this kind of autopilot so um that's something you don't need to get stoned to find out about. <laughs> yeah so i want to so going into that i want to read the following quote so you write a human being is for hume as much a part of the natural world as anything else Therefore, our actions must also be subject to the same laws of cause and effect as anything else. Yet it is commonly supposed that humans have a capacity of free will that allows us to make choices that are undetermined by prior causes. If this were the case, human choices would be causes but not effects. Were this true, it would make them then unique among everything else in the universe. On this view, says Hume, quote unquote, it is pretended that some causes are necessary, some not necessary. So it's so interesting that people kind of think of this, this thing as, a, you know, the soul or as free will as undetermined by anything else in the universe. Why do you suppose that? Well, I, first, I want to understand like Hume's thinking of it. But then why do you suppose we feel like we need that? Like, why isn't it OK for there to be some level of soft determinism where everything is maybe necessarily, um, you know, kind of completely put forth from the beginning mm. in terms of a grand plan? But there, our thoughts have a fact. I mean, I thoughts are effects our decisions are effects they don't necessarily exist in the vacuum yeah no it's tricky it's an interesting one that you know i mean clearly people often are troubled by the idea that the things they say and do might be just part of some big causal chain and they weren't the originators of them um and i think that obviously it threatens certain ideas we have about human freedom and so forth but having said that, I don't know. I mean, people often talk about the free will debate as though it were a universal one, you know, the, the, something that all humanity has to grapple with. And I think that's historically not true. The free will debate, as we discuss it in, in the Western tradition, is a, a fairly specific uh, notion. And, you know, there's no, there's no kind of comparable notion of free will in, say, Buddhist thought, or even in ancient Greek thought, arguably. A very good book was written on that, which is claiming that you know, um, the ancient Greeks had idea of agency and of autonomy, but none of these things had the idea of free will in its modern sense of us being the ultimate originating forces. And I just think that if you, if you dig away at it, it doesn't really make much sense. I mean, some people think about whether we have free will or not is some kind of scientific question to be tested in a lab. Whereas for me, um, there's nothing to test in the sense because it wouldn't make sense. So what would it mean for me to make a choice which was undetermined, was not itself the result of previous causes? What would it mean for me to be able to originate the causal chain? Well, I can't can't even answer that in a sensible way. It must mean something like I could choose now, for example, um, to, uh, I don't know, to to jump out of this window, right? Just just because for, for no reason other than the fact that I willed it, but I mean, that would be a, an empty and meaningless. It wouldn't be an expression of my autonomy. It would be an expression of my ability to do random pointless things. Right. right. Mm-hmm. Whereas the things we, we w- want to do, the things that are meaningful are always to a certain extent um, because of our causal histories. Right. So I don't want to jump out the window. But what I might do after this is I might, for example, I'm going to go and play tennis later, for example. OK, I'm going to go and play tennis. Because, not, because that's part of my history. It's something I've been playing for a while. I've developed the liking for it. Um, we have a regular game. You know, it, makes, it only makes sense because of my causal history. Right. If, if, if I had the freedom to decide that I'd just as much like to go and play um, baseball or something, then it would mean that I didn't have any settled preferences or any, and my preferences wouldn't be part of an embedded history or a biography. They'd just be meaningless. So absolute free will just seems to be a meaningless capacity to do things for no reason whatsoever. 
Right. And as soon as you ask, what does it mean to do things for a reason? Those reasons are going to involve facts about your history and your makeup. And, and that means they're not going to be things which you purely chose for yourself. Right. And that should be fine. What else, what else uh, would you want them to be? Right. And even just thinking about it, well, like I have a cup of coffee on my table, right? Mm. So I don't think I necessarily like coffee because I want to like coffee. If anything, I wish I liked coffee a little bit less. Mm. So I have to make like these sort of decisions and these kind of, um, I guess, inner agreements with myself where I tell myself, okay, I'm going to only have a couple of cups a day as opposed to maybe like five, which I would probably have if I could. So, but the thing is, that's also based on particular consequences and experiences that I've had. And it's unfortunately, I guess, also based on the fact that I have, for whatever reason, a taste for coffee, probably when I was a kid, I saw a bunch of adults drinking coffee and I was like, oh, this is what it means to be mature. And then I hated it for a while. And then I was like, you know what? But in order to be mature, you need to like coffee. And somewhere down the line, I developed a taste for it. Where it's like, as opposed to if you really ask me, I don't know, maybe... If you told me, let's say 10 years ago, they would say, hey, you know what? Sometimes you might have some gastrointestinal distress. You might end up drinking too much of it. Would you still want to like coffee? I'd say, you know what? Probably I'm not going to try it. I'm going to kind of stay away from it. So when we think about free will, I think what people want, I guess, is this sort of um, this ability to make a plethora of choices regardless of where they actually come from. Mm -hmm. But you can still have some version of whatever you would want to call it of free will because it's still me making the choice to have coffee, right? So yeah. I, yeah, so, and it's interesting that people, I, I guess for them, it's like they don't want the environment environment to, or their genes even to be determined right uh, how come you think that's such a scary thing for folks right? especially for genes well i think i think they, they, mis they, they, they misunderstand it. they think that if that's true then they are just robots and right. their conscious thought i'll come back to this about bypassing in a minute but I first what i just say in response to what you're saying i think the, the problem is that choice is overrated right mm -hmm. because the things that matter to us most in life are not things that we choose in that straightforward way so simple example and then the most important thing so for example, take a political commitment you have. If you have a political commitment. I think it's really important for us that we don't just perceive that as just a choice, which I could equally have made the opposite choice. Mm -hmm. The whole point about your political commitments is that you have an understanding of the way the world works. And having understood that, it seems to you that this is the right thing to do. And in a sense, you don't have a choice to just decide something else, right? right. So, you know, if you're in, in your country, for example, you know, I think most people who didn't vote for Donald Trump at the last uh, election, for example, don't wish they had the freedom, the capacity to simply change their minds and decide they would vote Trump. Right. You know, they, 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 they want it to be the case that, you know, um, that the political commitment only has a, f a force because it's perceived as something which is not just a choice. Right. Similarly, life partners, you're choosing a life partner. For example, we don't really choose a life partner in that sense, yeah? Now, here's the point. If, if, if someone says to you something like, will you marry me or do you want to live with me or whatever it might be, um, you have a choice in the sense that there's not a gun pointing at your head, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, no one's forcing you to do it. Um, that's what makes it free. But in a sense, it's, it's not free in the deeper sense that you can't just, if, if you're in a position where you go, well, you know, I could say yes, I could say no, 50-50, it's just my choice. Right. I'll say yes. You know, mm -hmm. and that, that would be very worrying. That would not be a very good basis upon which to make that choice. <laughs> what makes it a strong choice is that, you know, this, things are pushing that way, you know, <laughs> and you're very strongly determined to say yes. So, and so this goes back to what you're, you're talking about, why are people scared by this? Um, the, 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 point, the point is that you do make that choice for yourself and it's not coerced or forced. Okay. Now, why, why isn't that enough for people? Well, there's a really interesting, I'm not going to remember the name of the philosopher, unfortunately, who said this. I'm very, very bad with names. <laughs> it's okay. um, but we can look it up later. There's this idea of bypassing, right? Um, you should Google this while I'm talking or something. So it's the bypassing idea in free will. So the hypothesis is this, that the reason people are kind of worried by the idea that um, in a sense our choices are determined by brain processes or history, etc., mm -hmm. is they think that the implication of this is in a sense that our, our, our will, our desires, are, are bypassed, that all the causing is going on at some other level and we're just like the puppets of these things right whereas that's not what's true there's no bypassing going on it's simply that our choices our desires all these things they're real they're happening it's just that they themselves are the products of other other things that have happened in our lives mm -hmm. so in that sense it is absolutely integral to a free choice that i make the choice that i do it 
And all, all we have to acknowledge the fact is that I don't do it because I have this miraculous capacity that I can just choose out of nowhere. Right. That's not the point. So we shouldn't be worried that it's, it's down to... I think, yeah, yeah, so the other thing that might worry people is about responsibility. Right. And I think this, I, I'm going to blame, slightly provocatively here, uh, the Christian heritage for this, right? Because the point in blame is people say, if, I, if, if it's true that what I do is essentially the product of my history and my genes and all my past, and in that sense, everything I do has a kind of inevitability about it, doesn't that mean that I'm not responsible for what I do? Well, it means you're not ultimately responsible for what you do, right? Not ultimately responsible, but what is responsibility in practice? Responsibility in practice is not ultimate. We hold people responsible because we believe they have a certain capacity within certain limits to do things or not do things. Yeah. And, and it's by holding ourselves responsible and by feeling ourselves responsible that we can regulate our decisions and act differently in the future. Right? Yeah. So that's, what was, that's the only kind of responsibility we need. But of course, if you've got a history where you think there's such a thing as eternal damnation and eternal salvation, <laughs> then it's very tempting to believe that, well, God would be pretty damn evil to sort of like, you know, condemn you to hell for something you're not ultimately responsible for. Mm -hmm. So I think the idea of ultimate responsibility is something that becomes necessary when you think about ultimate punishment. But if you don't have ultimate punishment, uh, you don't need ultimate responsibility. You just need something a lot, a lot more modest. Than that. Right, right. Man, there's so many things in mind now. Um, so in terms of even so like what I do as a psychotherapist, I think it even kind of adds evidence to the fact that it's kind of really, really, really difficult for a person in terms of the context or the concept of free will to sort of just do things on their own. So if let's say you're talking to or you're speaking with somebody with a background or a history of trauma, we know that the vast majority of the time, what happens is that person can't really succeed in life without some important intervening factor. So whether it's a teacher, um, some other family member, a therapist, uh, you know, even a philosopher, the idea there is that you need somebody to intervene in that person's life in order for them to actually live a, you know, quote unquote, good life. So this person with a really traumatic background inevitably feels hopeless and helpless. So the idea that we have free will, that this person can just, and it's that conservative view of, well, this person could just pick themselves up those bootstraps, you know, kind of the world yeah. or in America, the idea is like America offers you, you know, the ability to sort of do, make whatever of you want of yourself. Yeah. It doesn't really work that way without a level of confidence and of self-love, some level of self-love that that person can possess without any intervening factors. So the idea of free will, I think, in psychotherapy is incredibly limited. Like you can't have, I, and I'm going to use this term not, I'm going to use it broadly just for the sake of argument. So the idea here is in free, we try to use in therapy the term of free will, but only on the basis of the relationship with either, again, the therapist, the parent, you know, some other intervening factor, because free will is only so limited that you can't just have this person automatically think, you know what? I know I could do it. I believe in myself and I'm going to go off into the world and make these better decisions. Like, no, you need the environment to help that person and to help kind of foment that sort of free will, right? If, if you want to even use that term, I now even as yeah, yeah. right. But the idea is there's some decision making, but good decisions really only come from intervening factors and environments. So it's so interesting that I guess in the, the, the mainstream people kind of find that so egregious sometimes. Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a lot that comes out there. I mean, I think it's interesting that like the 12 steps program, for example, mm -hmm. the, it, because this thing of like recognizing your dependence on a higher power and i mean in, in its origins that was a, a very very religious thing but it's become it's become a much more broadly interpreted thing in a sense that it's a recognition that you can't do everything by yourself right and you know that is kind of heretical in a highly individualistic society um like ours and arguably even more in the united states where there's this whole mythology of the frontier and and autonomy and freedom and, but it's actually very, very peculiar. I mean, a few years ago, I wrote a book about global philosophy called How the World Thinks. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's most striking there is a real difference between Western, modern Western thought and pretty much every other strand of thought ever in history, including ancient Western thought, mm -hmm. is that in, in most parts of the world, we understand what it is to be a human as being something which by necessity involves our relations to others. You know, mm -hmm. our relationality is absolutely central. Yeah. There cannot be an individual will or an individual person without other things. And it's kind of so obvious when you think about it, right? I mean, you know, uh, we, we're born completely helpless. We require parenting or, you know, uh, until we're quite old, uh, we require nurturing, we require mentors. We are utterly dependent on, on other people. And so, you know, it's only, so, so 
I think what's interesting from a therapeutic point of view, and excuse me if I'm talking about things I don't know enough about. But it's okay. I, I have some I have some experience of this. Uh, my, my yeah, you wrote, you wrote a great book. I was a psychotherapist. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah uh-huh. um, I think that in, 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 in therapy, and in particular around things like addiction, for example, it's really important that the, the client, or if you call them the patient, I don't know what you call them, people call them different things, yeah. um, does actually have to sort of gain some sense of, of agency. You know, and, 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 and that includes often a sense of responsibility, actually. Um, you know, if people, if people believe that, you know, they can do nothing and that they are simply, you know, pawns again, then they, they can't change what they can do. But I think what you're getting at, correct me if I'm wrong, is that the only kind of effective sort of version of autonomy got is got to be one which recognizes its limitations and the fact that it does depend on others. And it's not a paradox to say that we require others in order to have our autonomy. It's, it's a fundamental fact about, about human nature because uh, complete autonomy is a myth, right? Because uh, we, we're social creatures with social histories embedded in social situations. Right. And that's the kind of free will we want. So the free will, uh, a, a person in, you know, say uh, someone who's got an addiction problem wants, is, is the freedom not to have to sort of like uh, respond like that to the, uh, the, the call of the addiction. Right. is to break free of that. It's not the freedom to just simply have the capacity to do whatever they want. They just want to be free of that coercive control of either the substance or the behavior. Right, right. Right. And it's like, and what I love so much about Hume is that he acknowledges and understanding human nature that our kind of decisions are our moral decisions, basically. They, they come from a sense of, from, a, from the affect. They come from the, you know, the place of feelings. And so it's so interesting that he says that because even with my clients, what I see is that the ones who are more sensitive, so the ones who feel their emotions more deeply, whether it's anger, anxiety, uh, resentment, guilt, whatever, right, they actually tend to be the more ethical ones at times, right? I mean, this can obviously go in the other extreme too. Obviously, if, you know, sometimes they shut in emotions down and they feel the guilt and they still, you know, kind of lack of consideration for other people because they're angry at the world, that'll happen. But a lot of times it's the really sensitive ones that actually do the sort of good deeds because they feel so guilty for doing the wrong thing. So whereas with most people, we're able to kind of rationalize bad behaviors away. I mean, I do it too. And we're able to say, ah, that wasn't a big deal. Like who cares, right? And it, nobody got hurt. For the folks who are really sensitive, they're actually, they can rationalize it, but they don't accept those rationalizations because the guilt still persists. So for them, a lot of times they have what's called OC. PD, which is pretty much just perfectionism. And so the idea there is they have to be so morally kind of on point, because if they're not, they feel incredibly guilty for not doing so. And so when we're talking about going back into free will, when we're talking about sort of human nature, or at least in this case, the, the kind of co- the constitution of certain types of personalities, one can't say that those people chose to be that way or to chose that, to experience and exhibit that level of guilt, but they do. And the reason why they're so moral isn't necessarily because they've reasoned it through. A lot of times, I mean, they have to an extent, but, they, but they're also not able to rationalize it away. So it's like, yes, on the one hand, there's the reasoning process where they've been taught to say, okay, to think this is moral and here's why, but then there's also this excessive level of guilt that I would say the vast majority of people probably don't feel and their rationalizations are able to quell, whereas for these highly sensitive folks, they're not. So I love that Hume looks at human nature and just, I mean, maybe even the kind of neurodiversity of people, which is obviously a little bit more uh, contemporary. Um, so he looks at kind of human beings as... Um, not necessarily like the ultimate deciders of what is right and wrong, but there's this idea that, well, you know, there's an empathy that we feel for people. And if you're a really sensitive person, there's a sense of guilt that we may feel for doing the wrong thing, for being a bad person. And so can you talk a little bit about that, about how Hume understood ethics? Yeah, yeah okay. Well, big, big, big topic. But I think you, you're right there. I mean, he, there's this famous quote, which is a little bit notorious. It's a little bit misleading where he says, reason is and ought only to be the slave of the passions and by passions he, he means the emotions and what it means though is not that we should just slavishly do whatever we feel like doing at any particular moment that's not true but reason is a slave in the passions in the sense that um, the only motivations we have to do anything at all and that includes to be to be ethical has to be rooted in in feeling because because reason is basically inert right so reason can tell you uh, I'll give this example from uh, one of the early, fairly awful Star Trek movies where um, <laughs> they're trying to, they save the whale or something. You know, I, I can't remember which one it was. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Mr. Spock says it is, is rational to hunt a species to extinction. Uh, well, it isn't actually. I mean, it's irrational. If, if, if things are only rational, irrational, depending upon 
your values, which are ultimately in desire. So if it is your desire to be able to hunt something in perpetuity, it's irrational to hunt it to extinction because yeah. then you've got rid of it. Um, it's not irrational to hunt something to extinction if you don't care about that. Um, if you just want to have a bit of fun and your fun finishes, that's fine. So it's not rationality, which, which is the problem here. The, Wait, Julie, and, and, and just, just to make sure that it makes sense for our audience. What you're saying is that like logic is pretty much looking at it in the context of whether or not there's a contradiction and sort of idea. Yeah, right? log logic is this follows from this and that follows from that. But you're talking about the relationships between facts. Um, so, for example, if I want to persuade you, if you say to me, you know, I'm just going to go and I'm going to go and murder that guy. I just don't like him. I'm going to kill him. I can give you all sorts of reasons why you shouldn't, right? But at the end of the day, though, it, if, if you don't care about this person's life and don't think it has any value, then, you know, those reasons are going to be powerless, you know, and this is what a psychopath's like. Now, I think, so for me, the human emphasis on the emotions is really important. Now, if you want to understand it in practice more, in a way, maybe you're better off not looking at philosophy or at least tr traditional philosophy, but but literature and fiction. And I, I've, I've written in the past about the, the, the films of the Coen brothers. I think the Coen brothers films are deeply philosophical. And I think they really are very astute at really showing us rather than giving us a treatise about you know, what's really important in ethics. So I think Fargo is a great example of this, right? I mean, in, in, in Coen brothers films, so many of them, they were kind of, broadly speaking, three types of, of character. I'm not saying everybody, every character reduces to these threes, but there are three archetypes which keep recurring. Mm -hmm. One is the psychopath. There are quite a lot of films where there's someone who simply has no feeling at all for the, for the suffering of others, like in No Country for Old Men. And these people are just beyond the pale. They are just, there's no reasoning with them. There's nothing you can say about them. They're just evil to the core. Most people are not like that. The other people that are left are people who basically often, in a lot of these films, people are led to do really bad things, but they do it by these incremental small steps, little temptations, like in The Man Who Wasn't There. If you don't know these films, just go and see I, them. Yeah, I've seen them. So, and so it's, like this, it's this kind of corruptibility. It's like people aren't inherently evil. It's just a little bit of greed, a chip on the shoulder, whatever it is. They take one step at a time and they end up going quite far. Now, the really good people in these films are actually people who are just, they don't have a big moral theory. They don't even think about these things. They're just fundamentally decent. And it wouldn't cross their minds to do awful things. So in Fargo, you've got, you know, Marge is the, uh, the cop. And her husband, they're just fun. You know, at the end of the film, she just is just incomprehending about how people could have done these awful things, right? She just, she just doesn't, doesn't understand. And that's because she has this fundamental decency and empathy, which is not being corrupted by emotions such as greed and envy. Uh, and, and that's what makes a person good. So it's, so it's actually goodness is fundamentally about having a healthy psychological makeup, which is about having the appropriate positive emotions and the lack of those really negative corrosive ones, right? Yeah. Now this isn't in Hume, but the, the basic framework Hume gives of morality, which is let's understand morality as being rooted in, in, in the emotions. I think that, you know, it, it, you can see how this really does work. And if you think about people you know, I say to people, you know, say people, you know think about the people you know, the, the best people you know, the, most, the people you most admire for their goodness. Yeah, yeah. And, and they're not generally motivated by an ideology. Or, it's so interesting. Or a theory. They basically just have that. We, we, we say they have a heart of gold, don't they? And really? What we mean is that they, they, just, they just have that, have that fellow feeling for people. Now, that doesn't mean the, the, the mind's got no role to play because we also, also know people who have hearts of gold, but they have such soft hearts and soft heads that they actually end up doing things which aren't good or helpful. You know, they're motivated in nice ways, but because they're not thinking, they end up potentially even causing harm. So that's what we go back to the reason being the slave of the passions, right? So the passions say empathy, kindness, niceness. Reason says, okay, but if you want to achieve that, you've got to think about it because if you do this, it's not going to happen. If you do this, it will happen, et cetera, et cetera. Right, right. So reason is sort of like the, the, 
what would you call it? It's sort of uh, the kind of aspect of the mind that sets goals, right? It sort of helps you to, it's like, so the desires are pretty much just sort of either innate or based on experience or maybe even combinations. And the idea is the reason is sort of the planner of the mind. But it's kind of the planner, but I think it's a bit more complicated than that. And I think that Hume actually, you know, he sets the tone, he sets a template, but I think that he doesn't complete the, the story on this. And I think he understates the extent to which the, the mind is, that the brain can actually get you to reflect on your feelings and emotions and revise them. Right. So this is the kind of thing that as a therapist, you know, you, you'll be very familiar with this, I would hope, and things like cognitive behavioral yes. things. So, I mean, the, the thing is, it's not that our, our feelings and the desires are always ones we should act on, um, but that's where we start from. So for example, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm going to see a therapist because I'm, I'm, having, I'm burning out. <laughs> And I'm burning out because I've got this driving ambition to achieve, right? So I'm being driven by this emotional need for success and status and everything. Whereas actually, if I'd reflected on that a bit, and perhaps read a bit more philosophy, I could have come to see that that goal is kind of hollow and empty. Now, probably, it doesn't mean that my motivations are completely wrong. If I dig away, I, I might just find that I just haven't been careful enough, yeah? Sure. But what I'm really, you know, there are things that I desire which are actually self-destructive or harmful. And there are things that I desire which are good and I haven't managed to distinguish them. Now, our reason can help us to distinguish those things. So we can go, actually, no, yeah, what I want is, yeah, I do want achievement and I do want fulfillment, but I hadn't thought enough about what achievement means. I kind of assumed it meant, you know, the, the big apartment uh the the car the, the yeah, fame wealth right yeah yeah mm -hmm. um I, I do want i do want achievement but achievement is something is something is something else it's something it, it's not that so i think that you know reason has a good role in should have a role in getting us to reflect upon our desires and our emotions and then they can change in result i mean i think that's the really important thing because um you know people to think to common sense distinguishes too much between feeling and reason but you know, I'm, I'm totally persuaded of the view that most, um, a lot of feelings and emotions contain with them kind of um, assumed beliefs, right? I implicit beliefs. Yep. And if you change the beliefs, the desire changes. A simple example of this might be might be this. For a lot of people, find that um, they just grow up eating eating animals uh, because they're tasty and they're yummy, and it. They, they've had, there's an implicit belief which enables them to do that, which is that in a way animals don't feel. Mm -hmm. And as soon as they have the belief that animals feel, it changes their desire uh, for eating animals. I should just say, it doesn't necessarily mean it means they decide to be vegan. Right. It may be that they decide that they really got to make sure that they're not eating animals which are, I, I take this through. Is it not eating animals which are raised in these horrendous factory conditions, but only eating, eating animals which ones which have had uh, a good outdoor life, have been looked after, and you know the slaughter comes, but they've had a good life, right? But whatever. What I'm saying is, what you what you believe changes the way you feel. It changes your desires, and so there's this constant sort of dialogue between that. I think that's why the slave of the passions uh, phrase, although it's colourful, is a bit misleading because it makes it sound a bit too one way. There's yeah. this sort of dialogue between these things. And I say, I think, I think as a therapist, you're going to sort of think, I, I, I'd hope you're the kind of therapist who would agree. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Therapist, therapists come in many, many stripes. Yeah, yeah. And I actually, right. I, so yeah, I agree with you. And uh, so I wrote a blog, and I think it was maybe about two years ago, something along those lines called The Limits of Reason and Thus of Therapy. And so oftentimes, like, as I'm sure you kind of already know, and you wrote about this in your book, that rational arguments only get you so far. So if we even take the example of, let's say, uh, you know, animals don't have feelings, etc. Have you ever by any chance seen the 1995 movie powder no oh interesting okay so he's like so i don't remember exactly what he was but he was like so he was this albino guy who had like supernatural powers right and so what he did in one of these scenes so he was like um in this community there were a ton of hunters like he was like in this community with a bunch of like conservatives right so all of these different hunters you know they they were like constantly killing deer just for like sport they weren't even eating them and so in one of the most poignant scenes of the film what he does so the the one of the hunters he kills the deer right and then he takes his hand and he's like what are you, the guy's like what are you doing no no stop don't he's like no he 
he takes his hand and he puts it on the dying deer. And then the hunter actually experiences, completely empathizes with that deer passing away and he stops hunting. He's like, that's it. Right. He's like, I'm not doing this. Thing. And he breaks down. He literally starts hysterically crying. So going back into therapy, I think it's a lot of times like that too. So we, especially in CBT, right? We have these arguments for our clients, but oftentimes the point is honestly for them to actually put themselves into the world and to see the experience for them and to experience the kind of the scene or whatever, or the experience or the event for themselves. So the idea there is that reason is so limited because you have to honestly, unfortunately, you have to feel it too. And the only real way for you to feel it is for you to experience it. It's not that simple because unfortunately our brains tend to explain away our experiences at times. So sometimes you need these experiences over and over and over until your brain says, okay, you know what? I can't explain this away anymore. But I love that there's this combination of reason and experience where we could sit and we can argue about why you're maybe a lovable person and maybe, maybe why your dad was a narcissistic guy and it had nothing to do with you and your childhood experiences were not your fault. But until you go out into the world and you put yourself out there and you maybe allow someone in and you maybe allow someone to love you, you're never going to believe it. Not fully. Mm. Yeah. No, I'm just going to agree with that, Leo. <laughs> <laughs> And then so and just in terms of how Hume saw human nature, right? Why was it so important for him to understand it? Well, I mean, essentially, because he, he, you could just say he thought the great mistake of philosophy was not to root itself in, in human nature. It's to kind of try and understand the world as though we could occupy some kind of abstract godlike perspective. And in particular, in case of how to live, as though human nature were irrelevant to things like ethics and morality. But of course it isn't. I think that it should be quite obvious that ethics is going to... Uh, who knows what ethics would be like for Martians or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. But if ethics is about doing the right thing for ourselves and for others, which I think is true, then that is going to depend on what kind of creatures we are, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, for example, human beings are largely social animals. I mean, we differ in how much we need sociability. Some are more introvert or extrovert. We're essentially social animals. So given, given that, um, there is a cruelty in, in forcing people into isolation or um, it's, it's a cruelty in, in social structures which, which pr promote that. If human nature were different, it would be cruel. If, you, if human nature were different, it would be a cruelty to sort of make people go into crowded halls to listen to music, for example. That would be the cruelty, not the other way around. So mm. obviously human nature is, you've got to understand the human nature, we can understand how, how we want to live. But also if you want to think about how we ought to think, you know, um, you know, you need to understand how the human mind works. If you want, if you want to think better, you need to know how it works already. And this is why philosophers would generally wouldn't be very good therapists, right? <laughs> because the problem with the philosopher is that the client would come in and they'd say, this is my problem. And the, the philosopher would look for the logical fallacy <laughs> and yeah. say, well, there you go. Don't need to worry about that. You know, I mean, yeah. a, a, a phobia <laughs> session would be very quick. Sorry, <laughs> the spiders don't kill you. They've got nothing to worry about. Goodbye. I'll have yeah. my $70 now, please. And that's cheap. Um, but, you know, you've got to understand why. Why is it that? these things happen and, and the thing about Hume was he was a psychologist yes so so for example I think Hume, Hume understood that the human mind I mean again we know a lot more than Hume knew at the time but one thing he got fundamentally right was that uh, essentially you know, the, the, the way our thinking works is by the association of ideas and, that, and ideas are associated in, in a number of ways he, he claimed there were three very specific ones, but you know, it might be too limited, but it's a pretty good. And cause and effect is one, but the thing about cause and effect is, as he said, you never actually see it exactly. You don't see cause and effect at work. You see one thing followed by another. Mm -hmm. and, and you attribute cause and effect on the basis of certain assumptions. Right. And that means it's very, 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 very easy for um, false associations to be made, right? And uh, this is where superstition comes from, you know? You, you put on your lucky, your lucky uh, pants for, uh, to go and watch the, the, the Knicks play or something and they win. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, you know, I wore them, they won. You know, it, it, it may seem silly that it, you said, obviously there's no causal relation, but given that you never see the power that, le that joins cause and effect, okay. you only ever see one thing or another. Superstitions and stuff arise out of that. And so, you know, Hume wouldn't be that kind of philosopher who just said, this is illogical, go away. Mm -hmm. he, he would, I think he would have understood that what's happened is you've associated, uh, you know, spiders with, with this. 
and, and that breaking that association may actually be quite difficult because you know it's you, you didn't because you didn't form the association by a logical inference you're not going to break it by a logical inference either there's something else going on so i think it is it is it is very important yeah yeah or i would say that just to kind of add on to that i would say you can break it by a logical inference but it just it would only be a part of it right mm. to get you to yeah. actually put yourself out there and to say okay i know this mm. is irrational now mm. i can go and face my fear of spiders yeah, that's true. That's true. Yes, yes, yes. that's true. Yes, yeah. You yeah. say you, 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 you break. Yes, it wouldn't do all the work. That's the point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then, so with you, right? Wh what was it about him as a psychologist, right? How did he? How was he able to understand all of these different attributes? Well, the fundamental attribution error and all of these different heuristics in general, right? Because I mean, for us, it takes so you know, Danny Kahneman and Amos Tversky. I mean, mm. it took rigorous scientific studies for them to really figure out that oh, okay, yeah. well, these folks are going through these mental experiencing these kind of cognitive biases. How was Hume able to figure this out only on perception? Yeah, well, that's one of my favorite bits in the book, actually. It's only a short <laughs> section, but when I kind of realized that you could make this big list of things which we think about as like, you know, uh, cognitive biases, heuristics, which we associate with it. We, they got names and they had the experimental evidence in their favor in the 20th century. Right. But Hume got there first. It's amazing. I, I, think, I think actually simply because he was a very astute observation of human nature. Mm -hmm. And I think that actually... I think that, uh, in a sense, psychology, this is a kind of a slightly controversial, I'm not entirely convinced of it, hypothesis, but I think it's worth playing with. I do think that in a way, like a lot of disciplines, psychology has sought the uh, status and respectability of a natural science. And so mm -hmm. it's very keen on its experiments and its statistical methods. And it's very much, you know, it doesn't want to be speculation, you know, it's not, Freud just coming up with these theories in, in, in out of thin air. Um, ironically, although of course Freud wanted uh, psychoanalysis to be a science, but I think a lot of people would would say it isn't. And at this point, cue lots of objections by a psychoanalyst in 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 in, in your audience. Um, so anyway, <laughs> but uh, where was that? Yes, yeah, so, so how? But I think actually. What we come to see is most a lot of these experiments are duff. They don't work. They're not replicable. Um, I, and I think that, in a way, it might sound a little bit dismissive. It's not meant to be dismissive. I think the things that we decide psychology has got right, we don't decide they're right by verifying these experiments. We we, we see it's right by 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 looking carefully and seeing this corresponds to our observations about how people work and so in that sense you don't need experiments you just need to be an astute observer and Hume was those things you might say that what we you know what Hume didn't do and what we should do is we should test these things as much as possible and that's where I guess the experimental and statistical thing comes in yeah but you know a lot, of, a lot of things in philosophy and psychology they start with an insight right they start with an insight um, and then the, the, the theoretical apparatus and the experiments come later to kind of tighten it up or whatever it might be. Absolutely. And then so, and before we wrap up, I just, one of the, I think, it, maybe if not the most important aspects of the book, one of the most important aspects was Hume's understanding of the complexity of personality. So in one of the final aphorisms that you mentioned, you wrote, don't ask yourself whether you are brave or cowardly, generous or selfish, calm or volatile, but to what extent and in which ways you exhibit all of these traits. So I really love that because I think when you kind of meet people, especially as, like in my field where we're t we have a tendency toward diagnosis, the idea mm. is we kind of put people in boxes and then we kind of mm. forget that they're more than just these particular diagnoses. So on the one hand, you sometimes have folks who say, well, you know, we should get rid of these diagnoses altogether. They're very limiting. I don't agree with that because the diagnoses are most of the time pretty accurate, despite controversy. They're accurate, right? But I think there's more to the person than particular personality disorders, depression, anxiety, or mm. whatever. So it's so interesting about Hume is that he had this list of characteristics and he contradicted them yeah. <laughs> after each yeah. day. Yeah. Yeah, can that's you tell right. us about that? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's true. No, I think he's right. He, he, he had this sort of like self-portrait in which he sort of like brings out the contradictory aspects of his um, personality. We should talk about diagnosis another time. I'm, I'm probably with you in not wanting to get rid of them completely, but I may be more, more against them than mm. you are. But I think the point is this, that, you know, I, I, when we, a lot of things where we say a person is X or Y, we're not saying that that's all they are. We're saying this is... The, the, the most dominant aspect. 
And I think that if you take some introversion and extroversion, this is a very, very interesting one. Because we think of this as a spectrum and everywhere is, everyone is a certain point on the spectrum. But I think what we don't take seriously enough is that it's not that you have a fixed point on a spectrum. It actually, um, the context, the situation, what's going on, it will, will change it. So, you know, a person may be at times more extrovert than others. Uh, it might depend on exactly who they are around. It might depend upon their state of mind at the time. And so people can go through periods. I mean, Hume himself went through periods where he was pretty isolated. And he also went through periods where he was very, very sociable. And clearly these were all facets of his personality. And I guess something like courage, you know, I mean, some people are very brave in some situations. There are people who would jump into a burning building to pull someone out, but they wouldn't tell their best friend that that shirt doesn't suit them, you know? So they're brave when it comes to physical risk. They're cowardly when it comes to being candid and emotionally open. Oh, I can I add so, on to that really quickly with narcissists, by the way, they're actually the opposite. So they're very brave when it comes to being assertive and gaining what they want. But when it comes to helping other people, they're like, oh no, this is too scary for me. I'm out of yeah, here. Yeah. yeah. So I think, I think it's really important. And I, I do think that it, it bothers me a bit that a lot of self-help and sort of, you know, popular magazine articles are encouraging us to kind of constantly kind of identify our personality type on certain vectors as though that is much much more fixed and uncontext dependent than it is and so much is, is context dependent Absolutely. so you know i think that you know he would encourage us to you know think of yourself in a more in a more you're more complicated than that you're more contradictory than that and um the, the minute you sort of label yourself as just being one thing and, and I can imagine therapeutically, this is this is this could be very helpful. You know, I think I, I, I imagine I could be wrong, but one way in which people are often helped in a situation is that they have come to apply a label to themselves, and they say, oh, "I don't know, I, I, I never achieve anything." And being reminded of what they've actually achieved in life, um, sometimes you know, reminded of things that they didn't think of as achievements, but really were. Right. or things they're just forgotten is a way of like, you know, kick some out of me. I'm not, I'm not a failure of a person. I'm a person who's failed at some things and I've failed at some big things. Right. And I failed at things that really mattered to me, but that doesn't mean I am a person who fails. It's that essentializing. So, I mean, it's actually kind of therapeutically important. I think, I mean, like therapeutically in the broad sense, you know, whether you're in therapy or not, right. to kind of like challenge these sort of like, um, essentializing, globalizing labels we put upon ourselves. Absolutely. Wow. I love that so much. All right, Julian, before we wrap up, um, first of all, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on. This was a super enlightening and entertaining episode. And so where can we find you if we wanted to follow you socially? Website, social media? Okay. Well, the website's julianbagini.com. Fairly easy to find. And basically, because I've got a, a distinctive name, you can just find me. I'm on, I'm on Twitter a bit. I'm not very active on Facebook. I do have a Patreon site. So, you know, yeah, for shoot. a very small amount of money, you can get exclusive videos and we have a monthly philosophical cafe it's a, it's a bargain really <laughs> um so do have a look at that but um anyway but that's the advert over um thanks for having me on it's been a real pleasure talking to you absolutely so i'll talk to you soon julian take care okay thanks a lot bye